Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on this very special day. Um, so, I am planning to talk about some work on cognitive modeling as it relates to intersections with linguistic theory and experimental linguistics. And I'm betting that the framework that I'll be operating within and presenting to you about today is going to be unfamiliar to many of you. So I'm perfectly happy to take questions of clarification throughout the talk, okay? So don't hesitate to ask questions if things aren't clear. I purposefully put less than I thought would fill up the time, anticipating that you guys would have questions. So don't worry about that. If, however, I sense that we are veering down some dangerous rabbit hole, I might put off that question until the end of the talk. Okay, so don't be shy. We can have a conversation. That's fine. Now, the first thing to note about what I'm talking about today is that it is joint work with KJ Savinelli and Lisa Pearl. We're all at UC Irvine. And we're thinking about the pragmatics of truth value judgments, or as I like to think about it, a cautionary tale for truth value judgments. Now for the working semanticist, truth value judgments are crucial. To the extent that you associate meaning, say the meaning of a sentence, with its truth conditions, what it would take for that sentence to be true, these truth value judgments are critical for mapping out the truth conditions of these sentences. You can define the boundaries of true and false using these truth value judgments. So, they're very useful to us as working semanticists, but they are not without their pitfalls, and I'm going to talk about some of those today. The trick is, now that experimental semantics is taking hold, you might think that, oh, I can gain insight and solve all of my problems by just running an experiment. I'll let you decide after the talk whether or not I'm giving you advice to run experiments or to never run experiments. I'm not entirely sure that I've decided that for myself with respect to these truth value judgments, but I'll at least present to you some of the terrain of why these things are difficult. But first, what is a truth value? Judgment. So suppose you're in a world that has three horses, horse one, horse two, and horse three. And suppose that horse one jumps over a fence, and then horse two jumps over the fence, but horse three decides that she's not going to jump over the fence. Okay, so this is what we know about the world. And the resulting world state has two out of those three horses jumping over the fence. Okay, this is the state of the world that we observe. Now suppose Mary here comes in and describes the state of the world as follows. Every horse didn't jump over the fence. Did Mary speak truthfully or not? How many of you think that Mary spoke truthfully? Good. How many of you think not? <laughs> Interesting. There's some vacillation. Good. So this is a truth value judgment. Right? Deciding whether or not... I'm sorry, what? I did not vote twice. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to UConn. <laughs> I see this is going to get interesting. So this is a truth value judgment. You have to decide whether or not this sentence truthfully describes the scenario. You have options like true, or false, you might think of this as endorsing Mary's description of this state of affairs or choosing not to endorse this state of affairs. Now here, the majority of you endorsed this utterance as a description of this state of affairs, which is good because the majority of you are adults. However, not everyone likes to endorse this sentence. So here's a look at endorsement rates. Adults endorse this sentence essentially all of the time except for the logicians 
<laughs> Children almost never endorse this utterance. Now, I have a picture of a relatively young child here because this picture was cuter than the picture of the five-year-olds who they usually test in this experiment, but these numbers are for kids around the age of five. Okay? So kids do not endorse the utterance, adults do endorse the utterance. And the question is why? What's going on? Now the thing to observe about the sentence, every horse didn't jump over the fence, is that it is scopely ambiguous. There are two scope-bearing operators, at least, in this sentence. I've got every, this universal quantifier, and I've got the unt and didn't, which is negation. And depending on the relative scope of those operators, I'm going to get two different interpretations or two different sets of truth conditions. So when I have the universal logically scoping over the negation, as in the case of the linear order of those words in the sentence, I'm going to have an interpretation where I say, for every horse, it is not the case that the horse jumped over the fence. This I will gloss as the none interpretation. It is known as the surface interpretation because the order of these quantifiers at logical form matches the order of those quantifiers at surface structure, or in the linear order of those words in the sentence. But that's not the only option. You also have what's known as an inverse interpretation, where now I'm interpreting these scope-bearing elements in an order that is opposite to what I observe in the surface structure of that sentence. So here I'm saying it is not the case that for all horses, those horses jumped over the fence. I will gloss this as the not all interpretation. So I've got the surface interpretation, where every takes scope over negation, none of the horses jumped. I've got the inverse interpretation, where negation takes scope over every, not all of the horses jumped. Okay. So maybe what we should conclude is that adults who readily endorse this utterance are perfect, perfectly capable of accessing that inverse interpretation. Why? Here, two out of three horses jumped over the fence. It is certainly not the case that none of the horses jumped, two of them did. But it is the case that not all of the horses jumped. Okay? One of those horses didn't, so it is not the case that all of the horses jumped. So the inverse interpretation, not all, is true. Adults can access that, great, we're off and running. Kids who do not endorse this sentence maybe are perseverating on this surface parse of the sentence, and so they can't see that it could be true under this inverse interpretation. So you might conclude that the children cannot access the inverse interpretation, this not all interpretation of the sentence. Now that would be very nice if that were the end of the story. But that is not the end of the story, because in fact we can make kids a lot more adult-like by changing aspects of the task itself. So here are some changes that are going to get you higher utterance endorsement rates. Here's one. So, instead of just presenting children with the target sentence, every horse didn't jump over the fence, I first introduce an explicit contrast clause. So now what the children see is every horse jumped over the lock, so they see a preceding story where all of the horses jumped over the lock. They're given the sentence, every horse jumped over the lock, but every horse didn't jump over the fence. And now kids' endorsement rates jump to around 60%. That's a huge shift. The change here being, I've given you this explicit contrast class. So why should that lead to greater rates of endorsement? You see the same effect of the explicit contrast without actually putting in the explicit contrast. What do I mean by that? In the preceding story context, if I have a whole bunch of early successes, and then I give you the target sentence, you're still going to get lots of endorsements still at the rate of 60%. So here's what that story context might look like. Three horses decide to have some fun jumping over things. The experimenters are actually acting this out with puppets. One horse jumps over a cow and then challenges the other two horses to do the same. The other horses jump over the cow, one after the other. Then the first horse jumps over the pig and challenges the other horses to do the same. 
The second horse jumps over the pig. The third horse considers jumping over the pig, but decides that the pig looks scared and approaches him. The pig is, in fact, scared, so the third horse just walks with him instead of jumping over him. These are the materials that we're dealing with. So the target sentence in this case would be, every horse didn't jump over the pig. There's no explicit contrast, but I've got that early success story, and the kid's endorsement rate is significantly higher than the baseline, up around 60%. Why? Here's something else that you can do to increase utterance endorsement. Here, you can give what the experimenters take to be an unambiguous prime of the logical form. We'll come back to that. And if I say now, not every horse jumped over the pig, so you've got the supportive context for that, not every horse jumped over the pig, but every horse didn't jump over the fence, kids' utterance endorsement rates are around 80%. Okay, so this is something else that we can do to increase these endorsement rates. And, lastly, you can try and manipulate the goal of the task. So, if, for example, instead of talking about horses jumping, we're talking about, say, some man, some farmer, trying to find specific horses. Now, suppose that the farmer has found two out of the three horses. That's why that third horse is obscured. The target sentence is going to be, the man didn't find some horses where now I've got the negation and the didn't, and I've got the existential quantifier and the sum, and I want the inverse interpretation where there are some horses that the man didn't find. That would be true in this case. He didn't find horse number three. Adults will endorse this, kids in the baseline will not. But if I can convince you that in this story it is relevant whether or not the man found all of the horses, then the utterance endorsement rate is going to jump up to about 80%. So if I can manipulate the goals of the people in this story, I can manipulate <coughs> the utterance endorsement rates itself. Okay, so here is a look at the empirical landscape, at least according to these authors of the experiments themselves. So we've seen four manipulations to the experiment that lead to greater utterance endorsement rates. The explicit contrast clause, the early success story context, priming the goal itself, and the unambiguous priming of the logical form. Now, according to the authors, here is what those things are doing. The first three are leading to a satisfaction of the felicity conditions of negation. So if I tell you every horse didn't jump over the fence, there's got to be a reason why you're going to the trouble of negating that sentence as opposed to just telling me something positive in the first place. You've got to be contrasting it with something. This is what they think. Okay? And all of those three manipulations allows you to satisfy those felicity conditions of the negation. With the unambiguous priming, the authors say, you are explicitly priming the logical form, the relative scoping of those quantifiers at logical form. So if you encounter one logical form with a specific scoping of those quantifiers, then maybe later on that specific arrangement is going to be more accessible. This is what's going on in prime, so says the authors. Now unfortunately, upon further scrutiny, this is a serious idealization of what is actually changing in these experiments. So let's think about what is actually changing in these experiments. Starting with the explicit contrast clause. I tell you now that every horse jumped over the log, and I've given you the supportive context for that. But every horse didn't jump over the fence. What have I done? First of all, I've given you information, additional information, about the jumping ability of those horses. Now I know that those horses are perfectly capable of jumping over things, namely the log. This is just, on, at face value, things that are changing as I'm changing these experiments. Whether or not this is going to lead to ch the actual cognitive mechanisms that are going to change the utterance endorsement rate, we can test that later. But at face value, here I've changed something. I've given you information about the horses and their jumping. I also 
might have pushed around your knowledge and or expectations of the question under discussion, or QUD. Okay. So maybe the baseline question under discussion is, what is the state of the world? How many horses jumped? I want to know what the state of the world is. Maybe by telling you every horse jumped over the log, now all of a sudden you want to know whether or not every horse jumped over the fence. So now the QUD has shifted from how many horses jumped over the fence to did every horse jump over the fence, jump over the fence? Or did none of the horses jump over the fence? So in addition to giving you, you information about the horses and their jumping ability, I might be pushing around your expectations for the relevant QUD, question under discussion, in this scenario. You seem dissatisfied. No? Very satisfied. OK, good. Now, this is with the explicit contrast clause. The exact same holds with the early success story. Right? The early success story is the same as the explicit contrast clause. I just don't have the explicit contrast clause in that test sentence. So in that early success story, I am giving you information about horses and their jumping ability, which might affect your world knowledge about horses. And it might push around your expectations about what the question under discussion is. In the case of the unambiguous priming, it could very well be the case that I am increasing or decreasing the accessibility of specific logical forms, of the specific arrangements of these quantifiers at logical form. But it is also the case that I am giving you information about horses and their jumping, and I could be pushing around your expectations for whatever question is under discussion. Not every horse jumped over the pig. Well, did every horse jump over the fence? Maybe that's what's relevant as I'm interpreting that sentence. OK? So <coughs> these manipulations are noisy in that they are affecting more than just the specific aspects of this utterance disambiguation that the authors think they might be affecting. In the case of the goal priming, so if I somehow make it relevant whether or not the man found all of the horses and then tell you that the man didn't find some of the horses, here, presumably, what I'm affecting is your expectations about the question under discussion, the QUD. Okay. So if I tell you the man wants to know, or Mary wants to know whether or not the man found all the horses, then the QUD, one would hope, is did the man find all of the horses? So. Here's what the picture actually looks like. You've got these four types of experimental manipulations. Explicit contrast, early success, goal priming, ambiguous priming. And they seem to be affecting various things. Our world knowledge, our expectations about the conversational topic or question under discussion, and the accessibility of a specific logical form. Now, if you think about these three factors, they split broadly on the basis of whether or not we're dealing with pragmatic factors. So what we know about the world and what we think to be the relevant question under discussion, let's call those things pragmatic factors, factors about the use of language in context, versus grammatical or processing factors, how easy it is for me to access a specific logical. What I would like to do, what we wanted to do, and what we think we made some progress in doing, is figuring out how we can tease apart the potentially independent contributions of these factors to the complicated <coughs> process of utterance disambiguation. There's a whole lot that goes into disambiguating an utterance in context, these factors among them. And the question is, how can we isolate what could be an independent contribution from any one of these factors in this morass of utterance disambigu disambiguation? Well, what we're going to need is a pretty beefy tool. And here is the tool that we used. We used computers with which to develop computational cognitive models of the utterance disambiguation process. So what we wanted 
was an explicit, articulated, formal model of start to finish how it is that you go about performing these truth value judgments and disambiguating these utterances. Now, the model that we developed is created within what's known as the Rational Speech Act Modeling Framework. Are any of you familiar with the Rational Speech Act Framework? Okay, most of you not, a little bit, yes. Okay, so the Rational Speech Act Framework, or RSA, views language understanding as recursive social reasoning between speakers and listeners. So, I, a listener, interpret an utterance by reasoning about how you, a speaker, would choose an utterance to communicate to a listener who is interpreting that utterance by reasoning about a speaker who is choosing that utterance by reasoning about a listener, etc. Okay? So, the speaker and the listener are coordinating during this language understanding process. They're coordinating on the utterance and interpretation that is most likely to correctly resolve the question under discussion. Where again, in the basic case, the question under discussion would be, what is the state of the world that you, the speaker, are observing that you are trying to communicate to me, the listener? So the speaker observes the state of the world and chooses an utterance that would communicate that state of the world to the listener who is interpreting that utterance. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the RSA framework, this is my favorite joke that I get to tell my students. The good news is it's just math, and that's also the bad news. So we're gonna go through the math, but first let me give you the intuitions that this RSA framework was developed to capture in the first place. So this is just basic vanilla RSA. So suppose you're in a world where you've got a blue square, you've got a blue circle, and you've got a green square. And you, the speaker, observe that you are pointing to the blue circle. Okay? So the state of the world is, I am pointing to the blue circle. And now you, the speaker, want to communicate that state of the world to a listener. And you, the speaker, have to choose between the word blue and the word circle. What will you say? How many of you are going to say blue? Okay. How many of you are going to say circle? <laughs> it's very good. Okay, so why? Right? We're going to say circle in this case. Why are we going to say circle? Presumably this is going to involve lots of counterfactual reasoning, while if I had said blue, then the listener would have been less likely to correctly <coughs> arrive at the circle that I am intending, but circle is the only thing that is going to uniquely define this thing, so I know that the listener is going to be able to uniquely Right? This is a nice prose description of how we might think this is working out. We want to formally articulate that reasoning process that gets you this. Okay, so this is speaker behavior. Here's listener behavior. Now you have three options for what the state of the world is, which one of those things is being indicated by the speaker, and you hear blue. So I'm going to rule out the green square. How many of you think that the speaker is trying to signal the blue circle? How many of you think that the speaker is trying to signal the blue square? Okay. And now, of course, the question is why? And here we go back to this counterfactual reasoning. Well, if the speaker had wanted to signal the circle, the speaker could have just said circle, and I would have known it was the circle with 100% probability, but the speaker did not say circle. The speaker said blue instead. So given that the speaker is probably not talking about the circle, there's only one other blue thing there. He probably wouldn't say square because there are two of those things, and if the speaker wanted to signal this one, he could have said green. And again, you go into this deep recursive reasoning about what could have been said, what should have been said, what was said, and what you think is actually going on here. Right? So we want to model this reasoning process such that we can capture the independent contributions to this reasoning process and make some predictions and try to understand behavior. So, in the RSA framework, you've got these nested levels of recursive reasoning. At the base of this reasoning, you have what's known as the naive or literal listener. We're going to signal this thing as L0. Here is what the literal listener does. Again, it's just math. So the literal listener 
observes some utterance. I hear an utterance. And what I do is I resolve the QD, I infer what the state of the world is that that utterance could be truthfully described. So the literal listener is going to return a distribution over states of the world that that utterance could literally describe. How does the literal, literal listener generate that belief distribution? By updating his beliefs. So I have some prior beliefs of which states of the world I think are more or less likely. I have the literal semantics of that utterance, and I use that to return a distribution of states of the world that that utterance could truthfully describe. Here is a quick and dirty introduction to truth functional semantics for those of you who might not be familiar. So this is what powers the literal listener. Can you truthfully describe S? Here is how that semantics works. Suppose I have the utterance blue. It's going to map the blue square to true. It's going to map the blue circle to true. It's going to map the green square to false. Okay. Now you know truth functional semantics if you didn't before. So that's what's powering the literal listener in this RSA model. Okay. So those states that could be truthfully described, weighted by whatever prior probability I have about states in general, that's going to return for me a belief distribution over states that that utterance is literally describing. That's the literal listener. We are not the literal listener. This is some idealization about how we think speakers behave. The next level up is going to be a speaker, a pragmatic speaker, who chooses utterances to communicate some state of the world to that naive literal listener. So here is how the speaker behaves. The speaker observes the state of the world. I'm pointing at this thing. And the speaker returns a distribution over utterances that could communicate that state of the world to the literal listener. Okay? So the speaker is reasoning directly about the behavior of that literal listener. This map is a softmax optimization of choosing the utterance that is most likely to lead that literal listener to the correct world state. So the speakers aren't perfectly optimal agents, they can be a little bit suboptimal. This alpha business is going to control how optimal that speaker is. For those of you who are familiar with sentence processing, what the speaker is trying to do is minimize the surprisal of that state of the world given the utterance that the literal listener is observing. So, in effect, I'm a speaker, I want to maximize the probability that the literal listener arrives at the correct state given the utterance. However, I'm lazy. So I want to minimize the cost of the utterance itself. And by trading these two things uh, off each other, efficiency and efficacy, we can increase ambiguity in language. We're lazy. If we have a pretty good shot with a cheap utterance that you will arrive at the thing that I want you to arrive at, I'll use that cheap utterance. Okay, so that's how the speaker works. The speaker observes the state, chooses an utterance to communicate that state to this naive, literal listener. Now at the top level of reasoning, you have what's known as the pragmatic listener. That's you or I as we interpret language. We're very sophisticated, so we wear a hat. <laughs> what we do, is the same thing as the literal listener, we observe an utterance, we hear the utterance, and we infer what the state of the world is that that utterance is describing. But rather than reasoning directly about the semantics, we reason about the process that generated the utterance in the first place. Okay? So I, the literal listener, hear the utterance, and I think, aha! How would the speaker have chosen that utterance? Which state was that speaker most likely to have observed that led him to choose that utterance? So I interpret that utterance by reasoning about the speaker, who is reasoning about the literal listener, who is updating beliefs about the state of the world on the basis of the literal semantics of that utterance. So semantics is still playing a crucial role here, but it is rather indirect from the perspective of the pragmatic listener. First, I have to think about the generating process that led to that utterance. And through that, I can reason about the semantics.
So here is a proposal, here is a model for how it is that we interpret language. Right? This is the basic vanilla Rational Speech Act RSA model. You're looking at it, that's the whole thing there. So now let's think about predictions in the toy scenario that we considered first. So first we have this literal listener. The literal listener observes the utterance blue. I have to create a belief distribution of states of the world that that utterance could truthfully describe. What is that belief distribution going to look like? Now you have to speak. I heard blue, I'm the literal listener. Let's suppose that all of those objects were a priori equally likely. What is my belief distribution going to look like? 50-50. 50-50 on what? On the two blue items. On the blue square and the blue circle. And that's exactly what we're going to get in terms of predictions out of this RSA literal listener layer. Okay? So here's the blue circle, here's the blue square, and I'm at chance between those two things. This is what my beliefs look like as the literal listener. Now, we go up to the speaker. Now, let's say the speaker observes the blue circle as the state of the world and tries to choose between the words blue and circle, those are the only words that would literally describe this. Here is how the speaker is going to be. So this is the speaker's distribution over utterances to describe that state to the literal listener. And now the speaker is a little bit more likely to say circle than to say blue. Why? Because the speaker knows how that literal listener is going to behave. And the speaker knows if I say circle, then with 100% probability, the literal listener is going to arrive at the correct state of the world. If I were to say blue, there is still a chance that that literal listener could arrive at the true state of the world. So there is some probability mass on that. But that chance is 50-50. So it's not as good of an option. As I increase the optimality of the speaker with this temperature parameter here, you're going to see more maximizing behavior, and that speaker is only ever going to choose circle. Okay? So I'm already starting to break the symmetry in these utterances. And now when I get up to the pragmatic listener, things get interesting. So here, I'm the pragmatic listener. I'm trying to infer the state of the world. I hear blue, and now I am more likely to infer that the speaker is talking about the blue square than the blue circle. These were the intuitions that you shared with me, and now we have a model of why that is happening. Because the pragmatic listener has a model of the speaker, and the pragmatic listener knows, well, if the speaker wanted to talk about the blue circle, the speaker would have said circle. The speaker did not say circle. The speaker said blue instead. So the speaker probably intends that thing. So this is the belief distribution for the pragmatic person. Okay, so we've broken that asymmetry. We've calculated what's known as a specificity implicature. Good. So, vanilla RSA. Very good at calculating impl implicatures, not going to handle ambiguity for us. In order to model ambiguity resolution, we need to complicate this model a little bit. Here is how I am complicating this model. Is there actually time for a question now? Or yeah, go for it. Response? If you go for it, yeah. I mean, oh. I find it so surprising that you call this a probability for the pragmatic speaker. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, in a way you would think, like, it's really just about whether they are pragmatic or not. So either they are at a 50-50 or they are at a 1, you would think. So is it all hidden in the alpha? So, you know, I find, I find it kind of unintuitive that we say that that's the probability of them choosing a certain option given the state of the world. In terms of describing this distribution here? Yes. So... It is like cheating in a way. <laughs> cheating... I mean, calling it a probability for them to be you to, to describe the state of the world. Because at some point you're going to have to choose a single action. Is that what you are just, you're uncomfortable with? Well, what I'm uncomfortable with is that we're ending up at a point three in the model you have. Uh -huh. um, and it feels like it should be either. So we have to decide something that's not probabilistic in a way. I mean, you could have a distribution over speakers. Are they pragmatic or not, right? 
I mean. So this is a prediction that says 68% of the time that speaker is going to say circle. Yes. 32% of the time that speaker is going to say blue. And it's weird because I mean, like, if you go for a single speaker, you would think either he's pragmatic, then 100% of the time he should say circle, mm -hmm. or he's not pragmatic, then uh, it should be total random between blue and circle. So, so are we having a probability? What kind of speaker we are picking? So you can think about the speaker action as sampling from this distribution. And 68% of the time, that speaker will sample an action and wind up with circle and say circle. And 32% of the time, that speaker is going to sample blue and say blue. So that's how it can map back onto probabilities. But what you're touching on is a much deeper question, if I'm interpreting this correctly, which is, what are we modeling? Are we modeling individual speakers, or are we modeling the general speaker yes. behavior process? Yes. The RSA framework was designed to model the general behavioral process across the population. Now, that is not to say that it cannot model individual speaker behavior, but this was explicitly not designed to do that. There is some work trying to push RSA in that direction. This isn't it. Okay. But what this says is, if I have 100 speakers, then 68 of them should say circle and 32 of them should say blue. And the reason why this framework has really taken off is it is amazingly accurate when it comes to predicting the empirical behavior. So it's doing something right at the population level. At the individual level, we just don't have the empirical work done yet. Is that, is that more satisfying? So ultimately, it is in a way um, modeling if we are um, fetching um, a literal or a pragmatic speaker more than what a speaker is doing. Well, so the I reason why I'm not really comfortable with that terminology is both of these choices are literal. Yes. Okay. One of them is a bit more pragmatic than the other. Yes. There, at this point, I haven't shown you a way for RSA to handle non-literal language. Now, spoiler alert, it can, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, so think about this as a distribution over possible actions that you are going to sample from whenever you take an action. And so there are 68 circle balls in my bag, and then there are 32 <coughs> blue balls in my bag, and I'm going to pull one of those balls out, look at it, and say, aha, this is what I'm going to say to try and communicate this to the literal listener. That's how we can map this back to probability. Yes. Can I, sorry, I to even interrupt you even further, but let me, let me know if this response to Marcus' question is correct. I think it's even worse I mean, I, you know, I, I, love, I love this model, but it's even worse than she thinks <laughs> in the sense that uh, basically you, you treat every utterance as if it were from a new speaker. There's, there's, there is no persistence. You, you don't learn anything about there's no speakers way. from across time, from multiple utterances yeah. or anything. And you don't, you yeah. have no, no way of knowing who the next utterance is coming from. There's not, no such thing as you know, it's the it's it's same speaker or a different speaker or anything like that, right? So, that, so you are basically, you have a population of utterances and not speakers in, in the usual sense. So the point that I think you're bringing up is that these models have no concept of memory. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember what I have done, what you have done, what anyone else has done. What I can do in a single one-off case is <coughs> model what I think you were like as I'm choosing my behavior. So that is certainly possible. That's not outside the bounds here. But memory is nowhere in RSA at this point. I don't know whether that yeah. makes things better or worse. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so to the extent that you think that we can define individuals on the basis of their histories of behavior, this isn't in there, right? We are just generalizing across the population. And it does a good job. OK. So we were at the basic RSA model. 
And now, in order to model ambiguity resolution, I need my remote to work. Go. Ah, so this is what I need to do. So, what I'm going to show you now is what's known as a lifted variable variant of the RSA framework. So what I've done is I have parameterized the interpretation function here by some variable v. The literal listener is now going to observe the utterance and that interpretation fixing variable v and behave as normal. Okay. Nothing funny here. The literal listener just interprets the utterance with respect to that parameter and returns a distribution over states. The speaker chooses that utterance having observed the state and with some value for that variable in mind. Okay, so you could think of this as an interpretation for an ambiguous utterance. All of the work is done here at the level of the pragmatic listener who observes just the utterance and has to jointly infer what the state of the world is that that utterance is supposed to be describing and which value for V, which interpretation is intended for that utterance. Okay? So here is a schema for an ambiguous utterance. Right? So suppose I have some ambiguous utterance UM. I will parameterize this interpretation function by V. And I'll say if V is true, interpret it as U1. Otherwise, interpret it as U2. Now, this is a non-trivial assumption about utterance disambiguation with these interpretation functions. For now, this is an approximation for trying to model something like ambiguity in language. We can talk in more detail at, uh, in the question period about what we think might actually be going on cognitively when it comes to things like scope ambiguity. So if you think there is something like uh, issues of syntax determining which interpretations are relevant, then you probably don't want to be parameterizing your interpretation function to capture the different syntactic derivations. But for now, this is good enough to model the utterance disambiguation. And we can think more closely about what we actually want, assuming that we know what is actually going on that's generating these interpretations in the first place. But for now, here is what the schema looks like. Okay? So why is this a lifted variable variant of the RSA model? Because I have this interpretation resolving variable v, which I have lifted up through the speaker layer to the pragmatic listener layer, and that is where it gets resolved. So this variable is lifted from the semantics up to the pragmatics. Lifted variable, that's all it means. Okay. Now, which utterances am I dealing with? I'm gonna to need to give you some semantics to get some predictions out of this model. So suppose I have my ambiguous utterance every knot. Every horse didn't jump over the fence. Let's say if V, then interpret it as none of the horses jumped over the fence. Otherwise, interpret it as not all of the horses jumped over the fence. That's the general schema. What are the semantics for these two unambiguous utterances? Well, here is none. So none is going to be a function from states to truth values. And it will return true just in case the state is 0 just in case the state is none of the horses jumped over the fence. That's where it will return true. It will return false for any other state. Not all is also a function from states to truth values, but now it's only going to return true when the state is not equal to three. You could think about it as it's only going to return false when the state is equal to three. Okay, so those are the semantics that we're assuming for the unambiguous interpretations of this otherwise ambiguous utterance. So when I feed this into my RSA model of ambiguity resolution, I've got a picture that looks like this. And what I'm trying to do is infer whether or not I'm dealing with none or not all at the level of the pragmatic <coughs> listener. So I, the pragmatic listener here, every horse didn't jump over the fence, and I have to do two things. I have to infer how many horses jumped over the fence and I have to infer which interpretation was intended for that utterance. Which is not crazy when you think about how we actually use language. That's all you, the listener, get. This is what you have to do as a listener. You've got to infer these things. Okay, 
But that's not all, because we also have to capture the factor of QUD, the question under discussion. So right now, this model is built with an implicit QUD. Right now, I'm modeling states as numbers of horses who jumped over the fence. So the state could be 0, 1, 2, 3. The literal listener is inferring 0, 1, 2, 3. The literal, literal listener is inferring how many horses jumped over the fence. The literal listener is assuming that the QUD is how many horses jumped over the fence. We would like other QUDs in addition to how many horses jumped over the fence to see what effect that has on utterance disambiguation and utterance endorsement in the truth value judgment test. Here are some other QUDs that we would like to be able to model. Did all of the horses jump over the fence? Did all of the horses succeed? Did none of the horses jump over the fence? Did none of the horses succeed? Now, in order to model these little bastards, as I like to call them, this has to get really complicated. So here is how the model gets more complicated, and uh, well, we'll see how it goes. So we have to break the literal listener layer down into two steps. First, the literal listener does what you saw it doing before. Infer what the actual state of the world is on the basis of the literal semantics of that utterance and whatever interpretation that utterance is getting. Then, I'm going to use these QUDs as projections onto some other space. Here's how this is going to work. With the how many QUD, here is the semantics for the how many QUD. I'm going to take in a state, and I'm going to give you the state back. So the how many QUD is going to tell you the number of horses that jumped. The did all of the horses succeed QUD is going to take in a state, and it will map that state to true just in case that state is three, just in case all of the horses jumped over the fence. And it will map it to false otherwise. So I have projected the state from 0, 1, 2, 3 to a Boolean, true, false. The non-QUD is going to do something similar, only here it's going to map 0 to true and everything else to false. Okay, so these are the semantics for the questions that we're assuming. And now what happens is, okay, I've inferred what I think the state might be. Now I need to apply the QUD to that state in the case of the how many QD, I'm just going to get that state back. So I'm going to return a distribution over 0, 1, 2, 3. In the case of the all and the none QUDs, now I'm going to return a true or false value. That's what x is here. So it's going to be all of those states that map to true, all of those states that map to false. And now I'm going to return a distribution over Boolean. This is the complicated bit behind QUD. Should I go over this in more detail? So you're projecting those states onto potentially some other set of values. OK, good. So the literal listener is now returning a distribution over whatever the QUD will return when applied to the state. What this means is now the speaker observes the actual state, but now tries to uh, maximize the probability that the listener will arrive at the correct value of the QUD as applied to the state that the, that the speaker observed. So now I want to make sure that the literal listener is going to get the correct value of the QD with respect to the state that I'm observing, and the pragmatic listener, nothing has changed. I have to infer the QUD now in addition to what the state of the world is and which interpretation, but I'm still trying to infer what the state of the world is. This is the full model. So now, what we want to do is manipulate these factors, the pragmatic factors, the grammatical factors, <coughs> and generate predictions from the model. How are we going to manipulate these factors? 
Suppose I want to manipulate your world knowledge or your expectations, where your world knowledge controls how likely you think it is that horses are to succeed at jumping. Right? So I want world knowledge that says horses are great jumpers, world knowledge that says horses are terrible jumpers. I'm going to manipulate that by changing the state prior. So I'm going to make certain states of the world more or less likely. So I could make world state three, for example, the world state where all of the horses succeeded, really likely a priori. Or I could make world state zero, the state of the world where no horses succeeded, really likely a priori. This is how I can independently manipulate this factor of world knowledge and check to see its effect on the behavior of the model. I can manipulate the QUD expectations by manipulating the prior on the QUD. So I could have a flat prior where each of the QUDs is equally likely, or I could have a prior where the how many QUD is the most likely, or I could have a QUD where the all, did all of the horses succeed QD is the most likely. Etc. Okay, so that's how I can manipulate independently this effect of the QD. And for the scope access, this grammatical processing factor, I can manipulate which of these uh, scope values, surface or inverse, is more likely a priori. So this is how we're going to manipulate these independent factors within this model and try and observe some behavior, namely the truth value judgments. But we have to think about what it is that we're modeling. What is the behavior in the world that we are observing such that we are trying to predict that behavior? And this is where we come back to these truth value judgments and what a mess they are. So this is what we're trying to model. Mary said every horse didn't jump over the fence. Did Mary speak truthfully or not? Now, if you're not a linguist, if you're not a semanticist, this is not something that you do in your daily life. <laughs> this is not a normal task. This is very artificial and strange. What the hell are you doing when you're trying to perform this task? What I'd like to convince you that we're doing is deciding whether or not to endorse that utterance as a description of that state of affairs. You know, this isn't a novel idea springing from me, but this is one way of describing how it is that we perform truth value judgments. You see a state of affairs, you see an utterance, would I choose that utterance to describe that state of affairs? Now this is something that we know how to model. This is speaker behavior. It's not listener behavior. This is speaker behavior. I observe this state of the world, and now I have to choose an utterance to describe this state of the world. In the truth value judgment task, you have two choices for utterances. You have that thing there, and you have not that thing there, or saying nothing at all. So I can choose to endorse the utterance, or I can choose to not endorse that utterance, stay silent, and say, you know what, it's better for you to just back off to whatever prior knowledge you had going into this situation, as opposed to me screwing it up with giving you this crappy utterance. This is a proposal. Okay. Now, if we go back to the model that we had for utterance endorsement, we're not there yet because we have at our top something that observes an utterance and infers what the state of the world is. But I'm telling you that we should be modeling speaker behavior. Right? We want a speaker who observes the state of the world and chooses an utterance. We don't want a speaker who observes the state of the world, observes a specific value for the scope, observes a specific QUD. What we want is one layer up. So we're going to need what's called an S2. Here's how S2 works. S2 observes the state of the world and chooses an utterance to communicate that state of the world now to the pragmatic listener who is going to do the work of resolving all of those other variables. So, I choose some utterance to describe the state by reasoning about the pragmatic listener. I should also put the cost in there because the S2 speaker is just as cheap as the S2 speaker. Or lazy. Okay. Now, which utterances am I going to give as options to this S2 speaker. Oh, that should be an S2 here. This slide is a mess. 
So that S2 speaker has two choices. I can say the ambiguous utterance every knot, roll the dice and hope that that pragmatic listener will get it right, or I can say nothing at all, and what the pragmatic listener is going to do is just use his prior beliefs to infer what the world looks like. Do no harm. Okay? So here is how we can generate predictions out of this model. You've got to save the world. What's the probability that you will endorse that every not utterance to describe that state of the world? So in simple terms, here is what we're modeling. Here's the state of the world that you observe. Two out of the three horses jumped. What is the probability of choosing every knot over silence to endorse this state of affairs? Those are the predictions of this model that I'm going to be plotting for you. Now what I'm going to do is show you the predictions of the model as I manipulate those factors, the pragmatic factors, the grammatical factors, and see which of those factors have the largest effect on this utterance endorsement behavior such that we could blame them when it comes to the really high endorsement or the really low endorsement for adults versus kids. So, model predictions. What is the probability of endorsing the ambiguous utterance as a description of this state of the world? That's on the y-axis. Higher values mean you're more likely to endorse that utterance. If you want to map this onto truth value judgment behavior, you're more likely to say yes, true, whatever it is. Give the thing a cookie, however they do it. So higher values mean that you're more adult-like. Lower values mean that you're more kid-like. So then we're looking to see which of these factors are going to make you more adult-like versus more kid-like. I'm starting here with the grammatical factor of the scope prior. And what I'm plotting on the x-axis is the prior probability of the inverse interpretation, the not-all interpretation. So I could have a prior probability of 0.1. It's very unlikely to get that inverse interpretation or all the way up to 0.9, it's really likely to get that inverse interpretation. Okay, so as you traverse the x-axis from the left to the right, you're moving from really strongly favoring the surface none to really strongly favoring, I should have done it this way, really strongly favoring the surface none to really strongly favoring the inverse not all. Yeah? Just a little bit confused about the uh, of endorsement yep. uh, with respect to the Charles truth value judgment test. Uh, so I earlier took endorsement to mean uh, something more like, this would be a good thing for me to say, given a desire that, the, that I be understood or whatever. But the, the child the child is judging the puppets, whether the puppet uh, gave a roughly an accurate description of the, of the story. Uh, so it's not necessarily that, so. And what does that mean, right? And that's the proposal that I'm so offering to you that the puppet should have chosen in the manner of S2, basically. Uh, so the puppet should not have said that at all unless, uh, okay. Yeah, exactly. So did, this, did the puppet speak well or not? If the puppet spoke well, then yes, I would use that utterance to describe the state of affairs. If this puppet did not speak well, no, I would not use this utterance to describe the state of affairs. I see. Okay. And that's what you're getting on the y-axis. Yeah. Okay. So we see some effect of this grammatical factor. If inverse scope is just super likely a priori, you are a little bit more likely to endorse that utterance. But we're not anywhere close to child versus adult just with scope alone, so we're probably going to need some more help. Now here's a look at the world knowledge manipulation. So what you have on the x-axis is the strongly favored state uh, in the state prior. So I could have a uniform state prior where 0, 1, 2, and 3 are all equally likely states as I go into this situation. I don't have any strong beliefs about horses and their jumping. I could have a very strong belief that horses are really crappy jumpers. I could have some intermediate beliefs, horses are okay. Or I could believe that horses are really, really good jumpers. It's really likely for horses to succeed. So these favored parameter values get a prior probability of 0.9 in this distribution. We split the probability equally among the non-favored parameter values. Okay. Now things are starting to get a little more exciting. Now 
as I go from believing that horses are really bad jumpers to believing that horses are really great jumpers, I am <coughs> drastically increasing the endorsement rates. And lastly, you have the QUD manipulation, or the goal prior. So again, on the x-axis, I'm starting with a uniform QUD prior. They're all three equally likely. And then I'm selectively favoring one of those QUDs over the others. So first, I really think that the QUDs did none of the horses succeed, or did any horse succeed? Those things are going to work out to be the same. I could have the default QUD, how many horses succeeded, or I could have the did all the horses succeed. And what we notice is as I move from the did any horse succeed to did all the horses succeed, I am drastically increasing the utterance endorsement rates. Okay. So this poor scope prior over here doesn't look as exciting as the other two factors. What we notice is that the two pragmatic factors seem to have a much larger effect on this utterance endorsement than this grammatical factor of scope access. Which is curious, because me, as a linguist, as a semanticist going into this, I would think, well, it all depends on which scope you're getting for this thing, so of course that's going to have the largest effect. Maybe not. Maybe these pragmatic factors are even more important. And that would make sense, given the effects that we are measuring in these experiments where we are manipulating pragmatic factors. By manipulating pragmatic factors in these experiments, we are drastically increasing utterance and endorsement rates. Now, most interesting, for me at least, is this plot here, where we see that the pragmatic factors completely overwhelm the grammatical processing factor. So here I have set the world knowledge and the QD priors such that I believe that horses are great jumpers, and I think that the QD is did all of the horses. On the x-axis, I'm manipulating that scope prior. Going from, I'm really likely to get the surface scope to I'm really likely to get the inverse scope. And it had next to no effect at all. The pragmatic factors completely overwhelm it. They overwhelm it because endorsing the utterance requires no disambiguation at all. What could I possibly mean by that? If I'm trying to decide whether or not all of the horses jump, I could tell you every horse didn't jump over the fence. And either interpretation, none or not all, gives you a full answer to that question. The answer is no. You don't have to disambiguate the utterance. That is a great utterance under either interpretation. So of course you should endorse it. If I know that you, the listener, believe that horses are really, really great jumpers, okay, so you expect that all of those horses are likely to succeed, then for me to convince you that your prior beliefs, your expectations do not hold, that ambiguous utterance is really useful under either interpretation. Under none or not all, you know it is not the case that all of the horses jumped. So informativity is ruling the day here when it comes to this utterance endorsement behavior. I don't have to disambiguate that utterance in these cases, which leads to a really great utterance that I can endorse. It's going to be informative. It's going to either fully answer that question, or it's going to inform me that what I thought was the case is not the case. This was the aha moment for us. This was when we said, oh my goodness, what are we learning from truth value judgments? If not, which scope interpretation people are getting? If it can be the case that I can ask someone a truth value judgment and they can provide me a truth value judgment, and that truth value judgment does not require disambiguation, So this is where I wind up at the, I'm not sure whether or not I'm endorsing truth value judgments or not, right? Because when it comes to trying to explain this behavior, adults are really likely to endorse this utterance. Kids are really unlikely to endorse this utterance. I have shown you that endorsing the utterance doesn't require 
disambiguation. What it requires is the ability to manage the pragmatic context. So if you want to be looking for deficits in kids, <coughs> you should be looking for pragmatic deficits. And maybe that's not so surprising. I'm sorry. But you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get adult life <laughs> too. But there's nothing wrong with your scope access. <laughs> <laughs> right? So endorsing the utterance requires no disambiguation. You need good pragmatics. Kids don't have good pragmatics. That's not a surprise. Right? So where do we go from here? Well, we have this model that is making some really nice fine-grained quantitative predictions about behavior, where we can now turn these little knobs for each of these individual factors and test not just qualitative predictions, but quantitative predictions. So to robustly test this model, what we can do is attempt some way to manipulate the priors, like we were doing in the model, to see whether or not they have the empirical effects that we're predicting from that model. So that's something that's in the works. It's not trivial to try and manipulate people's world knowledge, or even QUD expectations, going into an experiment. These priors are pretty uh, closely held, and it's hard to push them around. If you have any suggestions, we're all ears. If you have suggestions on how to manipulate the scope prior, I would love to hear that one. In a way that is not going to manipulate the other factors. I've yet to encounter that. Now, in general, I think that what I find so exciting about this model, this family of models, is that it gives you a concrete proposal for how it is that we handle ambiguity. How it is that we resolve ambiguity you receive, you observe, an utterance that is potentially ambiguous. And you reason about the state of the world that that utterance is supposed to be describing while you are actively reasoning about which interpretation was intended. Now, what's interesting about this model is that, yes, we are attributing this sort of reasoning to these kids. So if you want to object to that, I would not find that objection unwarranted. However, this model does a really good job of capturing the kids' behavior. So maybe it's not so crazy to think that kids can engage in this sort of recursive social reasoning. The more research that comes out about kids in theory of mind and this sort of reasoning seems to suggest that they're not as dumb as we thought they were. That's good. So, maybe it's not so crazy to think that the kids are engaged. Now, what's also exciting about this model is there are cases where adults are pretty kid-like themselves. So if I tell you that there were two frogs and one frog jumped over a rock and the other frog did not, and then you hear the utterance, two frogs didn't jump over the rock, would you endorse that? So most adults do not. If you perform the same sort of experimental manipulations with the explicit contrast and all the other bells and whistles, the endorsement rates go up. So maybe adults are engaged in the same sort of reasoning as kids, which would suggest that we've got continuity in the development of this disambiguation mechanism. We don't need any sort of qualitative shift in development from kid to adult. We're all doing the same thing. However, adults are much better able to manage the pragmatic context, and they are less susceptible to new information because their priors are more robust. They've gotten more experience with the world. So, now you have the cautionary tale for interpreting truth value judgments. Before you can start interpreting truth value judgments, you've got to understand the pragmatics that go into giving those truth value judgments. And we can accomplish that with just a little bit of math. Thank you very much.